reading from the book of Luke, chapter 12, verses 32 through 40. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet, so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come and serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But know this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You must also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Between Two Pews um, for our August 7th recording. I'm Sarah Dorger. And I'm Stephen Kane. And we're going over Luke chapter 12 verses 32 through 40. Um, but before we get into that, we're currently in like the throes of Vacation Bible School right now. As we're recording this, there's actually, you know, Vacation Bible School campers upstairs and we've been doing all kinds of activities. And Stephen, I have a question for you. Why is Vacation Bible School always corny? I need to know because I've never been to a Vacation Bible School that's like, I don't know, cool. They're always extremely kitschy. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. <laughs> I, that's a great question. Uh, I've seen some that were not quite so corny or kitschy, mm -hmm. um, but it involved large churches with lots of people that dressed up in biblical garb and had like the village of Nazareth as a background and you know that sort of thing um, but I think that's just the nature of Bible school <laughs> and I think that's what makes that week of being around kids unforgettable I mean it's very like it's very charming like, don't get me wrong. It's just also extremely corny. Of course it is. <laughs> I mean, it's it's also, you realize they use the same music over and over and just change oh, yeah. the words around. Like oh, yeah. Adventure Island this year, and it was... Was North Castle. North Castle last, last year. year yeah. And, you know, the the same songs, just different words. And yeah. Like, oh, I actually okay. have a, a friend who's, I mean, like, they're they're just a few years younger than me, and I, I mentioned... Uh, discovery on adventure island was the theme and they were like oh my gosh i did that when i was a kid i did that same bible school i bet it's the same same exact thing and i was like wow this stuff probably doesn't get updated very much like maybe a like a graphic design update but probably not you know once you have the base the raw materials for a bible school i imagine it doesn't change very much over the years i, I think you're right i mean the the Bible story is what it is. Yeah. What they end up changing is sort of, you know, clearly a North Castle was <laughs> some way to try to tap into um, the HBO show about uh, castles. What was the name of that the show? Game of Thrones? Game of Thrones. <laughs> Minus, of course, the sex and violence. Of but yeah. course, yeah. And, and, and minus the, you know, like the crazy geopolitical and uh, you know thriller type type games but there was a dragon yeah. voiced by phil clary last yes. year if you know phil and the, the castle and yeah. it was frozen and it was yeah yeah it yeah. was it was very funny i love that that that's your like vbs version of game of thrones is well, knights of north castle i i mean you you gotta kind of look at it and see how they come out they change it to fit with something in the culture mm -hmm. um they also have subtle social messages or political messages like uh environmental care 
um, is woven in, mm -hmm. you know, that may have been very different from when you were going through yeah. or definitely different from back in the dark ages when I went through <laughs> Bible school. But yeah, yeah that the biblical stories don't change. It's more of the how they're implemented. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of biblical stories, we've got, um, I guess, it, I don't think that you could call this. Now, here's the thing. Um, parables. So parables are really similar to like metaphors in the sense that they're both allegories. But this doesn't feel like a parable because it's not necessarily, you know, like a story from beginning to end. Um, you know, the way that the parable of the Good Samaritan or the parable of the prodigal son um, is a parable. Um, this just seems like a, a an extended metaphor, so to speak, in this story where, you know, Jesus is telling us, um, you know, as he says, uh, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, um, you know, where your treasure is. There your heart will be also be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master return to return from the wedding banquet so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. So it's Jesus using an extended metaphor to explain to us what? What would you say that he he's trying to say here? Well, there's a lot of mixing of messages here. I mean, we first we start with don't be afraid, mm -hmm. but then watch out. You know, yeah. it's like, wait a minute. Are we So we wait with a positive sense ready for the return of, and he uses the story of the thief, but mm -hmm. the thief in this story or the thief in the message is not a bad thing. It is the coming of the kingdom. And so be ready for the coming of the kingdom. Always be ready. And I think that's, that may kind of get lost in all of this. Yeah. I, you know, when you mentioned that part, um, you know, we have this, this whole section about, uh, you know, blessed are the slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Um, but then it says, but know this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. So just from a... Um, you know, just kind of from an English major standpoint here, um, this is confusing context. Um, this is, you know, if I were unpacking this, unraveling this with my students, for instance, mm -hmm. I would say, hold on, wait a second. Who's the thief? Where did this come from? You know, I, I would tell them that if this was a paper that they were writing, I would, you know, take points off for uh, for not having proper context. Um, and, you know, that you mentioned that that's kind of the, the mixing of metaphors there, or mixing messages. Um, and, you know, it, it, you're right here. I'm struggling a little bit because, you know, it says be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet so that they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. That seems like an anticipatory, like, hi, welcome back. We have everything ready for you. You must be tired from being at the wedding banquet. Here, we, we've made your bed. We have water for you. You, here, rest up. That seems inviting and welcoming and, you know, ready for something good. But then it jumps straight into this idea of a thief. Mm -hmm. And if you know what time the thief is coming, you're not going to let your house be broken into because you're aware that there's going to be a problem. Are the, are the slaves in this story supposed to be watching for their master to come back from the wedding? Or is the master finding them is the master coming back from the banquet and finds them alert and ready just in case a thief comes? How am I supposed to interpret this? That's kind of where I'm confused. I think your your second part is correct. Okay. That the thief, that the, the slaves are ready for whoever comes, whether it's the master or the thief. Mm -hmm. um, I think what the metaphor here kind of gets clunky because one's positive, one's negative, um, and we assume the king, the coming of the kingdom of God is a positive. Mm -hmm. 
the thief could be also another sort of watch out because you're not sure. Yeah. <laughs> is it watch really out for the, false signals false, or, or false false prophets, gods, false, false gods, prophets, yeah. false. Um, so in your being aware, being awake, being alert, gotta make sure you open the door for the right one. Mm-hmm. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, it says here, blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat and he will come and serve them. You know, it it indicates here that he's exceptionally grateful for finding them, you know, alert, at attention, ready to do whatever. Um, and it says if he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so blessed are those slaves the idea that it has it can be at any time and mm-hmm. he's still going to find them in the same condition um the same amount of readiness now now you mention the idea of like you know the being alert for the the thieves thieves and i find that kind of interesting the idea that um you know you're not going to know the hour that your house is being broken into in this story Um, So not only can you not be lackadaisical, you can't be slacking off on the job, but you also have to be alert about who you're letting in. And that kind of, you know, that kind of takes me into, um, and I'm going to show that I'm not as educated as I should be um, in this, but I'm curious about it. Um, You know, in, I think it's in probably like, revelation where we get into kind of discussions of you know a false god that comes before and you know kind of tries to trick everyone into indicating like i am i am the coming um that sort of thing um you know the antichrist or whatever or the beast or however you say you're much more studied in this than i am this is something that is practically like apocryphal for me because it just I don't I mean there's a joke that Catholics don't read the Bible which isn't really true because (laughs) a lot of them do and um you know I I mostly what I've paid attention to is what happens in you know the the weekly masses right um but you know I haven't gone out of my way overly much to just sit down and read the Bible casually the same way that I wouldn't sit down and read the dictionary casually um like so do you have do you have thoughts on that out of curiosity do you you're over here giggling about the dictionary comment um do you have thoughts on the the false gods the the antichrist do you, did you ever ha- have to learn about this in uh, in Jesus school no no um we did get into a lot of apocryphal or prophetic um study Mm -hmm. i I think you're right this gets into playing on those images i would say that i'm much more influenced by my upbringing in the southern bible belt where Mm -hmm. the thief here was clearly satan who was coming to steal your soul Mm -hmm. and if you let in the wrong person Mm -hmm. you know the thief was clearly the bad guy Mm -hmm. um so you got to always be ready and how do you get ready you continually do things that are in keeping with god's salvation Mm -hmm. so it becomes a message of you, you never know you know that train hits you, you're dead, where are you going to spend eternity, yeah. that sort of thing. Do you um, walk in front of trains much? I try not to. Okay, good. But, <laughs> you know, the good Protestant, mainline Protestant in me says, put the brakes on that, and that it's not so much about, um, you know, always being, always having the prayer of salvation on your lips it's much more about being aware of what's going on around you Mm -hmm. Um, whether that you see it as a positive or negative your response to the coming of God's kingdom and how are you going to welcome that in Mm -hmm. 
Okay, something else that you said sparked my interest here, and you know, you you talked about the interpretations that come from your like Southern Bible Belt upbringing, um, and you spent most of your life in you know the the geographic South. Um, do, have you found like coming into the Midwest, um, and I don't even know if I can call it. Okay, yeah, Ohio has Midwestern culture, but it's it's getting more into that Appalachian, almost northeastern area. Um, is theology different here? Geographically, is theology different? Yes, it is. I think it's it's different for a lot of reasons. Um, ge- geography being one, but more. The where I grew up in the South was Southern Baptist predominance. Mm-hmm. In here, it's much more Catholic predominance. Yeah. So the the culture is formed by the influence of the churches, mm-hmm. um, and I think from from my perspective. The Catholic Church influence, while in some ways emphasizing certain aspects of one's life, is much more uh, open than the Southern Baptist, which focuses on other aspects of mm-hmm. one's life, i.e., salvation, i.e., sin, i.e., you know, you don't smoke, drink, dance, or mm-hmm. do anything. Yeah. Where, you know, so I think those sort of social cues have been influenced by the theology of the predominant Mm -hmm. church in the area yeah um i think what i'm surprised by is how much more the appalachian culture is influenced what i before moving here thought would be the north Mm -hmm. um that it's very similar to the Southern Appalachian culture that I've spent a lot of time in. Yeah. Um, more, more fundamental, more um, kind of grassroots mm-hmm. um, understanding of religion and faith. Yeah. And I mean, I think that um, I find Appalachian culture to be really, really interesting because it's a lot of Scots-Irish immigrants that settled here. Um, There's a lot of reliance on community. There's a lot of mistrust of authority in the government, um, but a lot of reliance on and trust in religion. Um, You know, there's very specific, like, you know, dialects and that sort of thing that influence speaking. And then there's a lot of um, culture that influences thinking that is very specific to Appalachia. And I, it, it just didn't really occur to me that, you know, that would carry over into the cultural theology as well. Mm -hmm. Um, something that I'm, you know, kind of interested in and would love to look more into just because I find the region to be really, really interesting. Um, more interesting than some of the other kind of like secluded, Um, mountain regions like the Ozarks um, you know of course Ozark people have their own culture as well but I find that Appalachian culture is very very distinct Um, and I think that that's really interesting Mm -hmm. Um, I think that I mean I know that the majority of the country um, of the United States is Protestant I think within that group the largest sliver is Methodists if I remember correctly, and I think that Methodists are the most numerous religion, like religious group group in the country, or maybe non-denominational Christian at this point, but I'm not sure. I think you're right about if you if we're talking mainline yeah. denominations, yeah. it's Methodists, and the Methodists apparently are about to split. Yes, but yeah, um, the predominant. Um, non-Catholic would be Baptist, whether that's mm-hmm. Southern Baptist, okay. American Baptist, 
which are vastly different. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you would have your non-denominational megachurch crossroads type. Which I think tend to be very... Um, they they tend to borrow a lot from Baptist Baptist yeah. church without the sign yes yeah it's what we used to but they, to. I mean um, you know I I find that kind of interesting because I think a lot of people who attend those churches would be very uh, surprised or even defensive to hear that like that's mm-hmm. a, no Crossroads isn't a Baptist church that kind of thing you know um, but I. Having I've only ever been to like Crossroads and Horizon and that sort of thing for like summer church camp type things, you know, that are fun, non-denominational, like, you know, grew up Catholic, but my parents were very cool with me attending other, you know, like non-denominational church camps and that kind of thing, especially if I had friends who were going because, right. you know, they were when it came down to it, it was like, cool, she's getting a Jesus education <laughs> and She's having fun while doing it, and she's building community, and it's great. Yes. Um, and I think that a lot of them would be really startled to hear that they just have borrowed a lot of Baptist theology without well, the without the name. Yeah, I, I, I think that's even more so than theology is the... Um, practices? Practices, but the way the governance, because oh, it's okay. pastor-led, mm-hmm. and there isn't a hierarchy... There is no, I mean, it's a, it's a standalone church mm-hmm. that congregational, if you will, without a lot of power in the congregation, it's much more pastor driven Yeah. Mm-hmm. or individual driven. So that kind of like, this is going to be circling back in a very, very loose way, but thinking about that idea of individual driven versus you know, group driven, congregation driven, and that sort of thing. Um, I, something that's kind of been sticking in the back of my mind a little bit with this passage is, um, the, the casualness, um, with which slaves are treated like members of the household. Mm. Um, I find that really interesting because when I think of slavery, I think of, you know, obviously, what the American connotations of slavery are and what a lot of historical connotations of slavery are. Like, absolutely brutal conditions. Um, You know, not being members of the household. You know, being seen as subhuman, being seen as, um, you know, fundamentally lesser than the owners. And I know that there's a lot of I mean, like, you know, you always run into people who say, like, oh, well, the slaves were treated just like members of the household. And it's kind of like, well, if they were treated just like members of the household, they probably wouldn't have been slaves. Um, You know, that's something that always kind of bugs me is an an attempt to justify that by saying, oh, well, they were treated well. No, they weren't. They were owned by another person. But the idea here of the... Uh, master coming back and it says he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat and he will come and serve them. And it gets back to this idea of the individual serving a group, that servant leadership that we see pop up in Christianity. Um, But I just, sometimes I struggle. Sometimes I have problems with, you know, we have that idea of having a servant's heart. Um, coexisting alongside with slavery which we you know we have modern sensibilities about this that humans shouldn't be owned right and something that is otherwise a good message sometimes can get really tainted for me because of the presence of that language or that idea um and i was curious if at any point history lesson wise if you'd ever learned anything about um, what slavery culturally would have looked like in Jesus' time. I think it's, there's a lot of different types of slavery, and uh, clearly we don't have how that's spelled out here. Um, if my army conquers your army, then you become my slave mm-hmm. in that sense. Yeah. Um, I may treat you well, I may treat you poorly, but 
that's one way in which slave another way in which we get the term slave is you can't you owe me money mm-hmm. and you can't pay me so you become indentured or you know yeah. whatever and then there is the i go by you because i need workers i need or, your back yeah. you know um and and i think where we my take on this and it, it clearly influenced by our time in the U.S. at this point where we have an understanding of slavery being, you know, the um, African-American sold as Chattel property lines. chattel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think what Jesus is saying is telling this story because the people would understand. Mm-hmm. It, and we look at it and we're like, boy, that's a terrible image. Yeah. But... He used an image of the time. I think the most important part is, and it it's harkens back to Monday, Thursday, mm-hmm. where he serves the disciples. Mm-hmm. So he's saying, here comes the master, and when the master gets there, the master will be so happy, the master will serve the slaves. And the people would probably be like, no, no way that's going to happen. Yeah. No master comes in and serves a slave like, like. So you it's shock reference. value. It's shock value, but it's setting it up because he knows that people know masters own slaves. Masters don't serve slaves. Masters don't come in after coming back from a wedding banquet and say, here, sit. I will fix dinner for you. That's not how it works. So he's subverting a relationship here. He's subverting expectations. He's upsetting a status quo with how they would have seen a, you know, God-human relationship. Instead of it being a masterful God and a human that is enslaved, it's a a flip scenario? Yes. Huh. But it gets lost because so much of it, I mean, we start out about give up everything you have. Yeah. And then we end with the whole thief narrative or image and it stuck in there is Jesus flipping a a societal norm on its head Mm -hmm. huh well that's a much more positive note (laughs) that than I started with for this reading um I'm really excited for next week um because next week is actually this is our our penultimate episode for this season and next week we have um Reverend Damon Lynch II, uh, you know, who is very well known here in the Cincinnati area for his work with activism and his work at New Jerusalem Baptist Church. And he so wonderfully and willingly was able to be on our podcast for our last episode of the season. Um, and hopefully we'll get to do this again in the future, Stephen, because I think that this has been really fun. Yes, um, it has. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for your idea. Thank you. I also want to encourage people to listen in next week because um, uh, these have been fun. Next week is fun with a huge challenge. Yes. Uh, it was quite a an honor to sit down with Sarah and Reverend Lynch and spend over an hour discussing biblical passage, but also learning so much about his work in the community and how that struggle continues. And mm-hmm. then what what does the Bible, what does Jesus have to say to us in this day and time, given that the struggle continues? Yeah, we're, it's, it's a it's a great session. We're presented with some very, very good challenges to finish up the season with that I will definitely be carrying with me yep. um, as I as I go forward. All right, Stephen, thank you. Thank you, and, Sarah. Uh, for the rest of you, we will tune in with you again next week. Peace out.